Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 24 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. My name is Jeff Winkle, and I am here as always with my good friend and co-host Dave Noe. How are you doing today, Dave? Doing real well, Jeff. It's great to be here in the vomitorium. It's uh, sunny outside, but bitterly cold. Yeah, we're in the middle of an Arctic blast. That's right. The yeah. polar creepy vortex we mentioned last week. Exactly. Are you staying warm? I am, yes. I think the high today was supposed to be 7 degrees. Ooh. That's Fahrenheit for those listening in the Outer Territories. Yeah, exactly right. But it's a very comfortable, I would say, 69 degrees here in the Yeah, Homer more or less. Yeah. Yep. Feeling good. Excellent. I'm excited to get back into Homer's Odyssey today. But we have a shout out. Yes, we want to say hello to our friend, actually a former student of mine, poor fellow, Mr. Trent Carroll in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa. That's right. The land of tumbleweeds. Is that the, is that the, I don't know the, what the city this, motto? I think that is the state motto, actually. <laughs> the land of tumbleweeds. Trent's been listening and uh, enjoying the podcast. We're very grateful. So hello, Trent. Thank you, Trent. And Jeff, I understand you have our opening quote today. I do. This comes from uh, Bernard Knox uh, from his introduction to Robert Fagel's translation of the Odyssey. All right, Jeff, let's hear it. For Achilles, a lie is something utterly abhorrent. But for Odysseus, it is second nature, a point of pride. I am Odysseus, he tells the Phaeacians when the time comes to reveal his identity, known to the world for every kind of craft. The Greek word here translated craft is a word that can be used in praise as well as abuse. Athena uses the word when, in the guise of a handsome young shepherd, she compliments Odysseus on the complicated lie he has just told her about his identity and his past. And it is with this word that Odysseus describes the wooden horse he contrived to bring Troy down in flames. On the other hand, Athena, Menelaus, and Odysseus use it of the trap Clytemnestra set for Agamemnon when he returned home. And it serves Homer as a description of the suitor's plan to ambush and kill Telemachus on his way back from Pylos. But whether complimentary or accusing, it always implies the presence of what Achilles so vehemently rejects, the intention to deceive. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Knox is putting his finger on a key distinction between Achilles and Odysseus. Right. Achilles never intend to deceive, never lie. That's dishonorable as a speaker of words and a doer of deeds. But for Odysseus, if I'm understanding this correctly, for Odysseus, it's a, a point of pride Yes, to be a clever deceiver. Right. And I think it has a lot to do with um, kind of questions of what's moral and what's immoral in the, in this poem. We've talked a little bit about that. I'm sure we'll get more into that. But it's a, it's a radically different landscape than the Iliad. It reminds me of the, the famous quote from Achilles in the Iliad where he says, hateful to me is the man who says one thing and hides another in his heart. Yes. Black and white, show me who you are. And Odysseus, of course, is that man. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and we meet Odysseus today for the first time. Yes, we do. Beginning of book five. Yeah. Uh, very famously, Euripides, sometime later, of course, 400 years or so after the time of Homer, in the Hippolytus has this quote where Hippolytus says, my tongue swore, but my mind was silent. Yeah. Right. The distinction between outward and inward deception. Right. But Odysseus, he's a deceiver, a trickster through and through. So what are we going to give our audience today? Well, the first entrance of the hero after whom the work is named, Odysseus himself, bandy-legged, versatile Odysseus. And the narrative continues and deepens in its complexity. We're going to navigate the many sides of this maddeningly deceptive hero and encounter more stories within stories like nested Russian dolls. So how much can we as the audience believe of what comes out of Odysseus's mouth? What do we make of his love-hate relationship with the gods? What, if anything, makes this man heroic? Are these things we still consider heroic? And can I think of any more questions? <laughs> it's one of the things that often drives my students crazy about Odysseus. I find more and more the students I, I have as they read the Odyssey, they don't like Odysseus. Really? They don't, well, they, yeah, they find him... They don't revel in his trickery as much as I think, like I did when I was. Is kid. this a, because of a strong sense of morality, or what? what I, is I don't it? know what. It, I think it's it's. They see him as, as two faced, and mm. I think they, they would. Um, they're much more kind of an Achilles camp. They like authenticity, even if it has a, a brutalness and brittleness to it, or I think a brutality so. and brittleness. I think so, and I think one of the things they have a tough time 
appreciating is the fact that Odysseus is crafty. The, the fact that he's able to lie so well is, I think, considered in and of itself heroic. Hmm. The fact that he can get away with these things, I think, from an ancient Greek point of view, is something to be celebrated and not just not a necessary evil. Right. Uh, well, he's always in a tight spot. He's yes. always in some fix. So the, the pleasure and the fun is seeing how can he get out of this. Right. So here we are right on the cusp of book five. Yes. And to summarize for the listener what has happened so far, Telemachus and Athena disguised as mentor, they first go off to the home of Nestor and Pelos. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we're in book four now, they go to the home of Helen and Menelaus in Sparta. Menelaus and Helen recount some stories from the Trojan War and they reveal the really crucial piece of information about Telemachus' father. Right. Telemachus finally learns that his father is on the island of, of Calypso. Yes, that he's alive and he is, is it, what's the name of that island again? Ogigia. Ogigia. Yeah. Right. With, fun to say. It is a lot of fun. With Calypso down there somewhere southeast of Sicily. Right. Now Telemachus has the information that he needs uh, to go find his dad and so he then departs to sail back with Pisistratus to the island of Ithaca. Right. So we learned that the, uh, very early on, the fact you know, that Odysseus doesn't show up until book five, that this is not just Odysseus' story. This is also about Telemachus' coming of age. One of the things that he learns uh, from Nestor and from Helen, Helen and Menelaus is how much he looks like his father. So he's starting to kind of understand his own identity. He's starting to really believe for the first time uh, that he is Odysseus' son. Yes. And part of Homer's brilliance is that just as those storylines and threads start to coalesce, he abruptly takes us away from that narrative and cuts to a completely different scene. Yes. So our sense of suspense is heightened and then it's put on hold, right? Would you hold please, right, for the next however many books? Yeah. Yeah. It's a part of one of the many um, complexities in this epic, particularly when you compare it to the, kind of the more linear fashion of the Iliad. That was really well said, Jeff. Thank you. Hey, well, let's begin at the very beginning of, of book five. And I believe that you are once again willing to recite some Greek for us. Yes, I would love to do that, Jeff. It's so melodious. So let's have the first four lines of Book Five. It sounds something like this: "Eos dek lakaon paragau u tithoi noia, ornuthin a thanatoi si fa os feroi e debratoisin, hoi detha oi tho kon dekathi zanon en daratoisi, zeus hupsi brameteis hute kratas esti magiston." So we have, we have Zeus there in that fourth line. Yeah, yeah, much thundering Zeus. That's his epithet, one of his many. Hupsi brometes, thundering on high. So what do those lines translate to? Well, I'm reading here from the Lombardo translation, Stanley Lombardo, one that we really like. And he says, Dawn reluctantly left Tithonus in her rose-shadowed bed, then shook the morning into flakes of fire. Light flooded the halls of Olympus, where Zeus Lord of High Thunder sat with the other gods. All right, so what's happening here? So Athena speaks up and she complains to Zeus. It reminds me a lot of kind of her early speech in, in book one. Correct. Where Zeus is, he's upset with humanity and Athena says, hey, wait a minute, what about Odysseus? You promised. Mm -hmm. And so here again, she's kind of complaining that nobody's thinking of Odysseus. Um, and so Zeus finally says, okay, it's time to, time to do something. So he sends Hermes, the messenger god, uh, down to Ogigia uh, to demand uh, that uh, Calypso let Odysseus go. Yes, and I love the way that Homer leisurely describes the different characters. Hermes straps on his sandals, he gets up from his seat. There's uh, a lot of patience in the character description. Yeah. He heads down then, and he arrives at Calypso's island, where uh, Ogigia, where he meets the woman, the nymph, for the first time. Do you have some of that translation you can read for us? Sure. Um, again, Lombardo. He stepped from the violet-tinctured sea onto dry land and proceeded to the cavern where Calypso lived. She was at home. A fire blazed on the hearth, and the smell of split cedar and arbor vitae burning spread like incense across the whole island. She was seated inside, singing in a lovely voice as she wove at her loom with a golden shuttle. Mm, these are beautiful lines. Really, really nice. Yes. Homer takes his time in developing the characters, and as we were saying last time, Domestic episode. Yes. We get a lot more of those homey scenes in here, and we'll see them on Ithaca, too. It's a, a very different vibe than the Iliad. Right. And with the Viacians in just a moment. So much of the action takes place inside. There's development of characters, once again, eating and weeping, all of those things that are not so much a part, uh, really a part at all, of the Iliad. 
Right. There's a lot of it's an indoorsy epic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So who is this Calypso who is uh, sitting by the blazing fire with split cedar and arborvitae and other essential oils (laughs) all around the island? Who is this Calypso? She is again in the canon of mythology. We don't know a lot about her. She's a daughter of Atlas, I believe. Okay. uh, Who is a titan. Um, but she's a, a minor goddess uh, with a with her own island. Mm-hmm. And there's, I guess, apparently a lot of these minor goddesses that have their own island. Well, there are a lot of them out there. there yeah, we meet, we'll meet Circe. Yeah, she's another one that shows up. But that's uh, right. Should we talk about her name? Yes, Calypso has a really interesting epithet. It's Euplakamos. Euplakamos. Yes. Which means uh, fair haired. Or with goodly locks. With goodly locks. Yeah. Apparently, she had long, beautiful hair, braided and tressed. It's an epithet of goddesses and women in Homer, uh, especially of Dawn, right? And yes. of Artemis. I'm reading here from the uh, Liddell Scott and Jones, the big lexicon, the great Scott. Uh, and later on, it's also used of boys and men in other uh, parts of Greek literature. Very interesting. So Calypso is the one you'd want for your shampoo commercial. I'm doing a shampoo commercial? Yeah, it's our new sponsor. That's not in my contract. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm imagining that Calypso's uh, you know, bathroom cabinet is filled with the, the finest of hair products. I'm sure. Yeah. What would be uh, some of the things you think she might have in there? Well, I think she would have a, maybe a full line of Bio Renew Hydrate Coconut Milk Shampoo and Conditioner. Maybe a Fructus Style Smooth Blow Dry Anti Frizz Cream. Oh, I think I think uh, Homer later mentions that she uses nothing but Fructus Style. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think one of my favorites, as I was you know googling for the kinds of products that Calypso might use, <laughs> was the Whole Blends Oat Delicacy Gentle Detangling Hair Milk by Garnier. Oh, by Garnier. <laughs> Hair milk. Well, I think it's book 25, yes. uh, where Homer describes Calypso <laughs> jetting off to Paris to restock on these items. That's right. It's a great coda to the whole kit and caboodle. So let's steer this back to the text a little Please, bit. Please, I think we have to. All right. So what happens next now? Hermes arrives at the home of Calypso, and he tells her, look, you have to let Odysseus go. Right. And she's not happy about it. Oh, no. No. Um, sh- let's read a little bit from the Lombardo. Okay. These are yeah. powerful words here. Right. So uh, Lombardo translates, he, Hermes, finished, and the nymphs aura stiffened. Words flew from her mouth like screaming hawks. You gods are the most jealous bastards in the universe, persecuting any goddess who ever openly takes a mortal lover to bed and sleeps with him. Powerful words. So what's Calypso complaining about here? She's complaining about the disparate treatment. The gods can sleep around with mortals, but the goddesses can't. Yeah. And she doesn't like this kind of inequality that's being displayed by the Olympians. Right. I think there's also kind of at root here um, that we see in so much Greek mythology is kind of the basic incompatibility between mortals and immortals. Right. They shouldn't mingle. They shouldn't mingle. When they do, something bad always happens. Almost always happens, yes. You want to read a little bit more? Because um, I like this part quite a bit. Yeah. So Lombardo continues here. When dawn caressed Orion with her rosy fingers, you celestial layabouts gave her nothing but trouble until Artemis finally shot him on Ortigia. Gold-throned, holy, gentle-shafted assault goddess. <laughs> Those are really wonderful <laughs> words. That's a punchy translation. So Calypso doesn't want to let him go, and Hermes says, look, if you don't, Zeus is going to treat you roughly. He's going to mistreat you, and that's just the way that uh, the justice of the gods is. All right, so Calypso has no choice. No, she's the hider, right? Again, kalupto, the Greek verb, means to conceal or to hide. Right, like a, our word apocalypse. That's right. To remove the veil. Yeah, that's right. Revelation. Yeah, so Odysseus has been there for seven years, uh, living with Calypso. As her love slave. As as her love slave. But not happy in that role. No. Weeping and crying. Uh, Every morning, isn't it the case? He goes down to the shore. Yes. Right, and in fact, the first time we see Odysseus as a kind of a a real-time character uh, in the epic, he's weeping, Mm -hmm. which is a really striking way to introduce your main character. Mm -hmm. So Dave, why don't you read some of these lines here where we see Calypso reacting to Yeah, so this is about 148. Calypso composed herself and went to Odysseus, Zeus's message still ringing in her ears. She found him sitting where the breakers rolled in. His eyes were perpetually wet with tears now, his life draining away in homesickness. The nymph had long since ceased to please. He still slept with her at night in her cavern, an unwilling lover made it to her eager embrace. Days he spent sitting on the rocks by the breakers, staring out to sea with hollow, salt-rimmed eyes. She stood close to him and started to speak. And eventually, she reveals to him that it is Zeus's will that he leave. Right. Odysseus wants to go, of course. He doesn't uh, like his captivity there. But he has some nice words for her, uh, words to the effect, just paraphrasing. I know, goddess, that uh, 
Penelope can never compare to you. Mm-hmm. She's just a mortal. She won't have perpetual youth. That you're far more beautiful. But I really want to go home. Yeah, exactly. And so she gives him an, an axe. She gives him some provisions. I mean, Calypso's a really sympathetic character. Yes, she is. Yeah. And she's kind of... Don't she, forget, though, she was enslaving him against his will. <laughs> this, is, this is true. But she's emblematic of kind of that, that curse of immortality. Yes. Right? She doesn't have the power of, of a Zeus... But she also doesn't have that edge of mortality as like, like a human being. And so she's kind of trapped in that, that kind of liminal state of being. It reminds me very much of the uh, elves in the Tolkien novels, right? Yeah, exactly. The sadness of them. They're larger than life, angelic in their power and beauty. But you really wouldn't want to be one of them. Right. And yeah, so the, like a Gigia like Rivendell, mm-hmm. it's kind of hidden away from the world. So the raft is built. He fells the trees, builds the raft, and then he leaves the island. Now he leaves... All by himself. Yes. Even though when he left Troy, he was in a large company of other Greek heroes and with numerous ships. Right. So we're, in terms of Odysseus's wanderings, we're fairly, fairly close to the end of them. This is real time. The flashback is coming next. Yes. Even more of a flashback. But one really interesting interpretive point that we're going to talk about, of course, much more in uh, future episodes is how different Odysseus is from Aeneas. Aeneas is not a hero unless he delivers everyone safely home with him. Oh, yeah, right. But Odysseus, there's this great funneling effect from the beginning when he leaves Troy down to the time where he arrives on Ithaca. Yes. He is the sole hero, and it's really only his destiny that matters to Homer. Right. And it's also a reminder of, of what his name means. He's the suffering one. You know, mm-hmm. His heroism, his humanity is embedded in what he endures. And yes. He, and he alone. And he alone. This yes. is why many readers find Aeneas a, a pale and unappealing character. He's too much bound up with Rome's destiny. He can yes. never really express his personal identity. He's got to bring everyone else along. Odysseus is quite different. All that matters is that he get home. Exactly. And so like we, we learn from Athena and Zeus that, yes, Odysseus is fated to return to Ithaca, but he's not this, he's not just kind of playing out fate's script as um, often kind of Aeneas's character is taken to be. Yeah, that's really well said. So Jeff, there's another episode right here in book five, about three quarters of the way through that you are particularly fond of. Yeah. That one of the white goddess. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, it's a scene that, you know, from my own reading doesn't get a lot of attention, but it, for me, it, it's so emblematic of, of who Odysseus is and the kind of man he is and the kind of uh, hero that he is. Uh, Odysseus goes out on his raft and immediately the wrath of Poseidon is manifest. Because that's uh, his nemesis. Right. Poseidon is going to try to destroy him for reasons we haven't yet been told. Yeah. Although they're coming up in the flashback. Exactly. So we'll learn about those, those details soon. Um, but Poseidon, of course, the god of the raging sea, the earth shaker, he comes full force and immediately Odysseus' raft starts to break apart. Mm-hmm. And he's in danger, it seems, of, of drowning, of dying out there. And then all of a sudden, this goddess emerges from the waves, um, who Homer tells us is the so-called white goddess, daughter of Cadmus, Eno. And she... One, once a mortal, yes. but, but now given the gift of immortality. Yes. And she is, she takes pity on Odysseus and she offers some help. And what is the help that she offers? What form does that take? Well, let me read a little bit from, again, the Lombardo translation. Uh, She says to him, Poor man, why are you so odious to Poseidon, Odysseus, that he sows all of this grief for you? But he'll not destroy you for all of his fury. Now do as I say. You're in no way to refuse. Take off those clothes and abandon your raft to the wind's will. Swim for your life to the Phaeacian's land, your destined safe harbor. Here, wrap this veil tightly around your chest. It's immortally charmed. Fear no harm or death, but when with your hands you touch solid land, untie it and throw it into the deep blue sea, clear of the shore so it can come back to me. Now, what I find so interesting about this is that if you you picture Odysseus, his raft is falling apart, he's hanging on by his fingernails, his drowning is imminent, you would think that he would cling to any kind of help in that moment. Yes. Here comes this this fairy godmother with this magic pair of pants. I always picture him... Since I saw the movie Castaway around 2004, <laughs> I always picture him as Tom Hanks. Oh, a, yeah. A very lean Tom Hanks leaving the island. Yes, with Wilson the volleyball. Right, with Wilson, the stand-in for Calypso. The volleyball as Calypso? You, you like that? No, I don't like that at all. <laughs> it's terrible. That's yeah, not even a person, much less a goodly locks. Most volleyballs I know are completely unlocked. Spearballed. Yes, yes. and uh, Calypso was very memorably played in the Hallmark adaptation 20-some years ago now by uh, the lovely Vanessa Williams. So now, 
it, when we see how Odysseus reacts to this, I think this is so uh, kind of central to understanding his character. Uh, instead of just grabbing the veil and saying, you know, thank you uh, for saving my life. Taking the divine help, right? Yes, right. His response, this is, this is what he says. He says, not this, not another treacherous God scheming against me, ordering me to abandon my raft. I will not obey. I've seen with my own eyes how far that land is where she says I'll be saved. I'll play it the way that seems best to me. Hmm. And then he goes on to say things like, you know, I built this raft. I know what it can do. I know what kind of swimmer I am. What I think is so fascinating is there's nothing about Eno that comes off as meddling or treacherous or devious. It's not like Circe. It's not like Circe at all. But Odysseus's gut reaction is, no thanks, I'll trust myself. We're so, back to the Andra. Right. Has he learned? Has this character changed from the beginning? Uh, we're never really told how he came to the island of Calypso other than just being shipwrecked there. Yeah. Uh, he had really no choice in that relationship. We still haven't been told about Circe. That's part of the flashback coming in uh, books nine and following. Right? Yeah. I mean, I suppose he's been through enough you know, horrible things that he's jaded and cynical and, and naturally distrusting. But that's also a hallmark uh, of the, the Matus trickster character, right? Yes, absolutely. So Odysseus refuses the help. He doesn't does. take the bait. He washes up on the shore of yet another island. Yeah, I should say that he does, he does end up accepting the veil. He but does take the bait. He does take the offer, but only after he's kind of he's he's refused it and he's questioned it and he's he's You're upset losing about it. me here. Veil or no veil? There, bait, bait or no bait? He doesn't want the veil, but he ends up taking the veil in the end because uh, without it he would have died. Okay. Yeah. Then he washes up on the shore of the island of the Phaeacians, right? That's right. Or the Phaeacians, if you want to say it that way, which is in the Adriatic. Uh, north off the coast of Epirus, if I'm not mistaken. I believe. So not that far from Ithaca. Yes, he had to go past Ithaca, though, to get there. So yet more circuitous wandering for poor Odysseus. Yes. But when he lands, this is now the beginning of book six, Homer switches the scene yet again, and he takes us to the bedside of the princess, the daughter of the king and queen, Alcinous and Arete, of that island. And her name is... Nausicaa. Nausicaa, or Nausicaa. Nausicaa, depends on what you do. There's a lot of vowels at the end. Yeah, right? maybe too many, like a typical Greek word. Right. So Nausicaa has just had a dream, and Athena has appeared to her in this dream. I'm going to read a little bit of that there, if that's okay. Yeah, please. So dawn came throned in light and woke Nausicaa, who wondered at the dream as it faded away. Now, of course, Athena was in the dream, telling her that a stranger was coming, and uh, creating within her a love for the stranger, correct? Yes. Okay, so to resume then, she, Nausicaa, went through the house to tell her parents her dear father and mother. She found them within, her mother sitting by the hearth with her women, spinning sea-blue yarn. Her father she met as he headed for the door, accompanied by elders, on his way to a council the nobles had called. She stood very close to her father and said, Daddy, would you please hitch up a wagon for me, a high one that rolls well, so that I can go to the river and wash our good clothes that are all dirty now. You yourself should wear clean clothes when you sit among the first men in council. So concerned about the laundry. She's concerned about the laundry. <laughs> yes, there are more domestic elements here. Indeed. Homer likes to describe Nausicaa. She's a princess. Does she have to do her own laundry? Apparently, yes. And her mother, Arete, sitting by the hearth, more spinning and weaving. Yeah. Uh, Homer likes to describe the women of his epics as beautiful, but they're also engaged in lots of household activities. Right. I, I mean, I have to think that the, you know, the, the scene in Calypso's house and now the scene here amongst the Phaeacians, it's preparing us for a similar kind of scene that we'll see on Ithaca. But what else is coming up after the break? We actually have some nudity coming up. We do? Yeah. Okay, well, this is going to be tasteful. Of course. Family friendly? Yes, of course. All right, well, stay tuned, listener. We are very pleased to announce that today we have a brand new sponsor, Ad Astra Coffee Roasters of Hillsdale, Michigan. Jeff, does every sponsor have to have a Latin name? Yes. I mean, we've got Ratio and now Ad Astra, not to mention Hacketus Maximus. That's right. Uh, but I guess no, Dave, but these folks know how to roast some wonderfully delicious coffee. I have enjoyed their Las Lajas Microlat, and I know you like the Tenebris, the Dark Shadows of Coffee Roast, and some other great blends. And what should our listeners know about Ad Astra? Well, Jeff, Ad Astra, to the stars, is a husband and wife team founded by an ex-Marine, Patrick Whalen. 
Does that give the coffee more kick? Drop and give me 25 cups? I don't know. But I understand that they have a new label series called the Poetry Series featuring poems by Wallace Stevens, Rainer Maria Rilke, and William Wordsworth. I haven't tasted this yet. The whole beans are on their way as we speak, but it's supposed to be lyricism in a cup. Right. And they also only roast coffee that ranks 84 or higher on the 100-point coffee grading scale. Not When I give grades, 84, is a, that's, that's a solid B. That's a B or a B. It's in B-minus territory, isn't it, a little bit? I think you're, you're a harsher grader than yeah, I Yeah, probably but, so. But, I mean, in 84, uh, in coffee terms, this is... This is an A. It's pretty high. I like to leave a brackish tang in the uh, mouth of my students when they get that grade back, but not this coffee. So listen up, AN listeners. Go to Ad Astra Roasters, A-D-A-S-T-R-A Roasters.com and check out some of their delicious offerings. How do they do that, Jeff? Well, they can go to the website and they get a special 10% off by entering the code A-N-A-A. A-N-A-A. Ad, ad nauseum, ad astra. Okay. Yes. Ad astra roasters.com. They also offer a monthly subscription service with free shipping on the first of the month, and they also can coordinate wholesale contracts. Sounds great. Ad astra roasters.com. This episode of Ad Nauseum is also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Since 1972, Hackett has been an independent publisher of high-quality translations in the field of classics, as well as many other corners of the humanities. Jeff, can you tell our listeners about some of the works Hackett has to offer? I can. Hackett's growing classics list includes hundreds of titles covering ancient history, literature, philosophy, political science, and classical language study. Hackett editions are ideal both for classroom use and general readership, offering affordable modern translations and editions of classic works with helpful scholarly notes, annotations, and introductions. I love their classical lit backlist, including the very nice translation we're using today, that of Stanley Lombardo for the Odyssey. And I also really love the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata series by Hans Orberg. Jeff, can you tell our loyal listeners how they can get some of these bargains from Hackett? Yes, Ad Nauseam listeners can save 20% on any order and receive free shipping from Hackett Publishing. All you have to do is go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, publishing.com, find the text you want, and enter AN2021 in the box which asks for the coupon code. That's a great deal. Don't hesitate. Check out hackettpublishing.com today. So let's say our ad nauseum listener gets her coffee from Ad Astra. Yes. She gets some great books from Hackett. Mm -hmm. How's she going to uh, brew up those books and beans in order to enjoy a quiet afternoon? Well, I would recommend going to ratiocoffee.com. Ratiocoffee.com, you say? Yes. You know, you have a coffee uh, maker from Ratio, isn't that right? Yes, I do. It's called the Ratio 8, R-A-T-I-O, another wonderful Latin word. The good people of Ratio Coffee in Port Portland, Oregon, Mr. Mark Helweg, a, a strong devotee of the classics. He makes these gorgeous machines that brew high quality automatic pour over coffee. That sounds great. And uh, our listeners can get a deal from Yes, Ratio. they can. I believe they can get 15% off. 15% off the Ratio 6, which is a beautiful stainless steel machine. Brews consistent coffee with no brackish tang or hot, scorchy underside. They go to Racial Coffee, R A T I O Coffee dot com. They enter the coupon code. Uh, I believe it's A N C O. It is A N C O. To get and that fifteen percent off. Fifteen percent off. So go to RacialCoffee dot com. Enter the code A N C O. <laughs> All right, Jeff. So as we get back into it now, you promised our listeners nudity. Uh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I believe I did. Right. So Odysseus... One of your many foolish promises. I know. And I'm, I'm regretting it now, but we got to talk about it. So Odysseus washes up on the shore of the, the island of the Phaeacians, and he has to give the veil back, mm -hmm. right? So he, he's reduced to nothing, right? Yes, he's, that's really the point of it. Yes. Right? It's not gratuitous. It's the man who was the king of Ithaca with a lovely wife and a newborn son and lots of wealth and territory and uh, retainers and so forth. He leaves Troy and he's reduced to absolutely nothing, not well, even the shirt on his back. Exactly. He's lost all his ships, all of his men. He's, uh, he's, he's left uh, just destitute. Yes. And that's how we find him. So what kind of uh, music do you think Odysseus was listening to as he lay there on the beach? I'm thinking that uh, John Lennon's um, It'll Be Just Like Starting Over was probably running through his head. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, seems kind of like a Simon and Garfunkel moment a little bit. Yes, exactly. Kind of, I hear like the opening notes of like Sound of Silence. Right. Yes. In introspective yes. uh, bridge over troubled waters sort right. of thing. Exactly right. What does one think about when you're covered in seaweed and naked on a beach? I don't know. Yeah. That's not something I've experienced. <laughs> 
So he's laying there just like another one of the jellyfish exactly washed right. up on the shore. Right. So Nausicaa then, she comes down to the beach with her entourage. She's got the laundry baskets. She's got the giant jug of Tide. Right. She's the basket. Do, but yes, exactly. She's ready to do some household chores. And she discovers him there. And her ladies-in-waiting are a little bit freaked out by this. She keeps a level head. And it strikes me as, as just while we were talking about this is that Homer is funneling us down uh, once again. So he takes us from Calypso's Island. Calypso's a goddess to the island of the Phaeacians. And Phaeacians is, is a strange place. It's, I mean, are they mortal? Are they immortal? They're somewhere in between. And now we have another beautiful young woman who, again, uh, the suggestion might be another lover for, for Odysseus. Uh, of course, she doesn't end up being uh, a lover of Odysseus. But we're getting closer and closer to Ithaca and Penelope. So is Nausicaa betrothed to someone? Is there an, another wedding in the works here? Well, ultimately, as we see, uh, her father ends up um, offering her hand to Odysseus. Who yeah. declines. Who declines, of course. Right. So the other young ladies are, as you said, freaked out. They're startled, this naked stranger. Uh, but Athena has made him younger than his natural appearance. Is that right? Right. She's enhanced his beauty. Yes. And hers as well. Yes. But this is not really in order to help them transact a relationship or even a friendship. It's all divine manipulation to get him back to Ithaca, correct? Right. This is all just kind of part of a larger larger plan. So where does the plot go from there? We've got him on the island of the Phaeacians and Nausicaa is there. What happens next? Well, she brings him home. And he's entered into the house of uh, Alcinous and Aridi as a, as a guest. Mm -hmm. Look and, what the cat dragged in kind e of thing. Exactly right. And again, we have this, this theme of Xenia, of, of hospitality showing up. And I think the Phaeacians are meant to kind of show us, um, again, how you do this to a T. Okay. Um, and so it doesn't matter that this naked guy covered in seaweed is, is on their shores. He's an honored guest. And they take him in, and they, um, they they throw a party for him. They end up throwing games for him, and all this before they even kind of sit him down and ask him who he is. Yeah, they don't know his identity. Right. Once again, concealed identity. So this brings us really to the beginning of book seven. Yes. And I love the description here about line uh, 119 uh, of what this place looks like, the palace of the Phaeacians. Can I read a little bit of that? Please do. All right. Outside the courtyard... Just beyond the doors are four acres of orchard surrounded by a hedge. The trees there grow tall, blossoming pear trees and pomegranates, apple trees with bright shiny fruit, sweet figs and luxuriant olives. The fruit of these trees never perishes nor fails summer or winter. It lasts year round and the west wind's breath continually ripens apple after apple, pear upon pear, fig after fig, and one bunch of grapes after another. The fruitful vineyard is planted there too. One warm at level spot is for drying grapes in the sun. Elsewhere, some grapes are being gathered and others trod upon. In front, the unripe clusters are losing their bloom and others are turning purple. So again, it's a, a domestic scene. It's a, it's a farm scene. It's beautiful. It's paradise. It's reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. Right, right. Uh, the author is clearly taking great joy in this delicate, elaborate description. Very unlike the Iliad. Very unlike the Iliad. And I think we also see a bit of foreshadowing, too, is that we, we hear about Odysseus's own orchards uh, very late in the epic, too. So again, this is, I think this, this is meant to get us prepared for Ithaca. Um, and Absolutely. To, yeah, without a doubt. So just like with Telemachus's visit to Nestor and and uh, Menelaus, we find that these households in the midst of something. Um, there, there's a busyness, and we we learn that the Phaeacians are uh, engaged in a festival honoring Poseidon. Poseidon. Yes. This is Odysseus's nemesis. Right. So right. this is bad timing, isn't it? How is Homer going to pull this off? Well, I think he raises lots of interesting questions that I don't think are there are easy answers to. But so I think that one of the things that's going on, Phaeacians are they are an island people. And surrounded by water, Poseidon's the one god that you want to keep appeased and happy. Right. He can but, cause a lot of trouble for an island-bound culture, a marine culture. Exactly right. And But it's in contrast to, of course, what is just we've seen on the seas with Odysseus and his raft. They are appeasing, calm the anger, or they're celebrating this god that has, has caused Odysseus so much trouble. And so I think this is also kind of foreshadowing and kind of prepares us for when we finally learn why Poseidon is so angry with Odysseus. Yeah, something coming up in books nine and following. Yes. But before we get there, we have to find out why does Odysseus eventually recount all of his prior experience to the Phaeacians? What's the setting and the catalyst for that? 
Right. So as the Phaeacians host Odysseus, they offer him you know, food and drink, a place to sleep. Uh, they honor him with athletic games. And all of that is done. All of that funnels down to a moment where they can finally ask him, who are you, stranger? And more or less, I don't think it's much of an exaggeration that Odysseus takes four books of the poem to answer that question. Yeah, so let's pause for a moment and think about this. The athletic games, Yeah, this is the way that you honor a guest is by sports? Yeah. Remember we were talking earlier about the death of Achilles, the funeral of Achilles. You, you celebrate the life of someone, the life of a, of a great hero by throwing athletic games. Competition as a, a way of, of, kind of celebrating others in culture is a very Greek thing to do. It's kind of strange to us. I was, I was looking around uh, for... An analogy, and I was thinking about family picnics, extended uh, Noe uh, family gatherings, and yeah. also those on my mother's side. So, you know, we arrive 11 a.m. or noon, right? The late arrivers get there at 1, set out the picnic baskets, have a meal. Inevitably, uh, someone gets involved in some kind of sports, right? That's true, yes. Lawn games. Did you ever play jarts? I was just thinking of jarts. You were thinking of jarts. The jarts were banned because they were impaling people, right? <laughs> I suppose <laughs> great minds think a jart, I think is the phrase, right? right. Uh, croquet, right, with those uh, hard wooden balls, yes. right? Yes. Uh, all of those things. Wiffle ball? Did you ever do wiffle ball? I did a lot of wiffle ball. Yes. Yep. Uh, the the um, the bat that always had a crack or a hole in it. It would fill with a little bit of water on the end. Yeah. You know? These were the ways that we spent a summer afternoon. There was also horseshoes. Sometimes the kids would have foot races and things like that. Yeah. Is that analogous to the games in Book 8 here? I think broadly speaking, yeah. I think that, you know... Um, in my experience growing up, aside from my, my, my Uncle Walter, the, the point was just to have fun and not to kind of prove how, how great you were and, and rub your, the, the face of your opponent in it. What are you telling us about Walter? <laughs> the less we speak of Uncle Walter, the better. Okay. Was he, was he very competitive? Very competitive. So he had a Greek spirit. He did. He kind of took it way too seriously from, from our point of view. Yeah. But of course, the games here, the ago and the contest, the point is to see who's best. Yeah, it is very serious. Yes. Does Odysseus compete? He does. Um, he, at first, he, he declines. He doesn't want to get involved. But then one of the young Phaeacian men kind of goads him with an insult. Hey, old man. It was more serious than that. Uh, but then that gets uh, his dander up. And Odysseus of course, says, because nobody's as great as Odysseus. Of course not. And so he says, I got to show these young bucks what's what. Right. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We've got to back up a little bit. So before the games takes place, Homer introduces us uh, to the bard, the poet of the house, Demodocus. Right. And so um, you want to read a little bit from Homer and tell us about I do. this guy? What does the name Demodocus mean again? Something about the, the one who teaches the people. Okay. So it's, it's often thought that Demodocus is Homer in disguise. Yeah. The bard himself is speaking through the character of Demodocus. So I'm reading here book eight around line 80. The muse moved the bard to sing of heroes. The piece that he sang was already famed throughout the world. The quarrel Odysseus once had with Achilles, going head to head at a feast of the gods with violent words, and Agamemnon, the warlord, rejoiced that these two, the best of the Greeks, were at each other's throats. For long ago, when he crossed the stone threshold in sacred Pitho to consult the oracle, Apollo had prophesied that this would happen. That was in the days when the great tide of woe was rolling in upon the Trojans and Greeks alike through the will of Zeus. This was the song the renowned bard sang, but Odysseus pulled his great purple cloak over his head and hid his handsome face. He was ashamed to let the Phaeacians see his tears falling down. So this is extraordinary. So Odysseus' own, his own life, his own story has already entered the realm of kind of popular legend. Yes, and there he has to sit anonymously and listen to others sing about him. Right, and it's worth reminding our audience too that uh, the Phaeacians can have no idea who he is at this moment. So Odysseus is weeping, he's embarrassed, and this is when Alcindor stops the feast and he orders the games to begin. And then we get the insult and Odysseus kind of shows him what he can do with the discus. Um, and then it's back inside to continue the party and Demodocus sings another song. So this is a kindness, correct? Yes. By the king Alcinous to Odysseus. He sees the guest weeping during the recounting of the Trojan events mm -hmm. and so stops the song. Yes, exactly right. 
And then we get this, this second song of Demodocus, which is extraordinary. He sings the story of, of Aphrodite and Ares, this, now, this um, famous affair. Yes. Now, they're, they're not married to each other, right? They are not. Who is Aphrodite's husband? He, she is married to Hephaestus, the, yes. the smith god. So this is the original Beauty and the Beast story, right? Exactly. Without the happy ending. Beauty and the Beast has a happy ending? Yeah. Have you seen the... the no, no, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I haven't seen it. So Aphrodite, the most beautiful of all the divinities, compelling love, and Ares, the dullard, the brute, kind of. The dumb jock. Yes, but they uh, they transact a romance. They do. And how does Demodocus tell the story, and what do you think it's doing here? Well, I think that's the most fascinating thing about it, the, that um, I always tell my students that you know Homer doesn't throw things in for the sake of throwing them in, that he's up to something. So this is a story within the larger story, which is commenting on the bigger picture. So in the story, Hephaestus, he suspects that something's going on. So he, he arranges this, this clever trap that when Aphrodite and Ares crawl into bed with each other, this net descends and entangles them up in these in, inextricable uh, bonds that they can't get out of. But the net is invisible, isn't it? It is invisible, right, right. So He's such a clever, skillful craftsman. He makes this invisible net. And while they are in flagrante delicto, it falls upon them on the bed uh, and kids, if you don't know what inflagrante delicto means, that's the point. So <laughs> Exactly right. And so then all the gods gather around. The, the goddesses are too ashamed, embarrassed by this to kind of pay attention. But the gods are, are all too eager to gather around and, and to comment and, and laugh. And I think this is so interesting is that the gods mock Aphrodite and Ares, Ares in particular. Um, for their adultery. For their adultery. So Apollo has some sharp words to say. And Hermes says something along the lines of, hey... Yeah, you know, triple the chains, and I'll still get into bed with with Aphrodite. Hmm. It's a big joke to them. Okay. And, you know, Hephaestus, uh, he seems to say, you know, this is a problem. What are we going to do about this, guys? And they all think it's a big laugh. So the gods are so immoral here. Yes. And what are we as the reader, the viewer, supposed to think about it? Anything? What do you think? There are places in this epic where I think Homer reminds us of, of kind of the ridiculousness of the gods and how their immortality kind of makes them, in some ways, pathetic. But I think the real kicker in this story is the one god who does speak up and say, hey, no, there's a penalty that needs to be paid here, and that's, again, Poseidon. And so Poseidon comes in as the voice of reason, the voice of morality, that's going to make sure that Ares pays a, a, a proper penalty for this. So this is the same Poseidon who's hounding and harassing Odysseus all over the Mediterranean? The same Poseidon that the Phaeacians are throwing a festival for? And I think that too, I think it raises these questions about, uh, in, the, in the reader, in the listener of, uh, okay, well, who is Odysseus then? Um, if this guy is against him, right, and so I think it raises, I think it raises some moral issues that I, are, I think are often in more kind of facile readings of this epic, not explored all that deeply. I think that's really well said, and it also occurs to me that perhaps Homeric theology is not as simple as some people might think. Oh, exactly. No, it's, it's extremely quite complicated. Complex. Right now, in addition to this, I think that uh, you know, in trying to answer the question, okay, why this story? Why is, does Homer want Odysseus listening to this story? Uh, it leads me to think about, okay, who represents who or what in this story? So I think I, we have a kind of brains versus brawn thing going on here, where Hephaestus is, uh, you know, Hephaestus is like Odysseus, not much to look at. He's a little bit ugly. He drags his leg around, but he's very clever. Ares here is the good looking guy, but not a lot going on upstairs. Mm -hmm. And so it's Hephaestus as a stand in for Odysseus. Again, like we, I think we were talking in the previous episode, there's a warning here or maybe a worry about has Penelope been faithful? And the sharp contrast between outward and inward reality. Yeah. What you see is not necessarily what you get. So when we get down to the end of book eight, this is the moment where the Phaeacians finally sit down with the stranger and more or less ask him, about his identity. Who are you, stranger? And that's where Odysseus then becomes the narrator of the epic and answers that question, who are you, in books 9 through 12. This famous flashback, arguably the most, the best known part of the Odyssey, these, these fantastical adventures that he has. It's the part everyone reads. Yes. The Cyclops, the Lotus Eaters, 
Crashing Rocks, the Cattle of the Sun, all of that kind of stuff. It's great stuff. It is. So yeah. we're going to cover that, but we're not covering it in the next episode, right? No. Dave, tell us about this exciting thing that's coming up. Yeah, we have a guest host, our, our first guest host, uh, and that is, uh, or maybe we should just say guest, is uh, our colleague and friend, Dr. Gary D. Schmidt. Yes. He is the author of the famous book, The Wednesday Wars. And he's coming on and he's going to talk to us about how the classics have shaped him as a writer and a thinker. Right. I'm really excited about this. I am too. If you haven't read any of Gary's books, I did a lot of reading in preparation for this. I mean, I knew the Wednesday Wars, but okay for now and trouble. The Sin Eater. uh, Yeah. These are some incredible works. Great stuff. We are so honored to have Gary on. And uh, so that's going to be the very next episode after which... We're going to return to the Odyssey, correct? Yes, I think our next Odyssey episode we're gonna we're gonna tackle Book Nine, which is uh, more or less front to back about the the Cyclops. And we have some other guests coming up, don't we? We do. Uh, Doctor Susan Wise Bauer is going to be joining us in in March to talk about the uses of history and also maybe up some stuff about lambing. Lambing? Yes. Yeah, that is the the birthing of lambs. Yes, I, which I know nothing about. Uh, I know very very little, probably <laughs> less than you. So Susan is a, a famous pedagogue. She wrote a book called The Well-Trained Mind. Uh, and then we have a third special guest that we're going to announce later. But hey, we got to get out of here, don't we? We do. We got because uh, the uh, actually the, the Fantasy Bonsai Club is, is uh, booked the vomitorium for this slot. What now? Yeah. The, <laughs> you know, tiny trees? Yes. But these are imaginary tiny trees. Okay. So the <laughs> Fantasy Bonsai Club, you say? Yeah. So they're going to come in and pretend to prune their little fantasy trees? Exactly. And get them down to size? Yes. And... It's, it's unsettling. But the good news is there's very little cleanup. <laughs> All right, before we go, uh, Dave, tell us a little bit about the Moss Method. Right, so we're running a Valentine's Day special. Today's the last day, February 16. Show your love of the classics by signing up to learn some Greek. Go to mossmethod.com and you can get $50 off Module 1 or 75 off Modules 1 and 2 combined. All right, listeners. Hey, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast or leave a review. You can send us an email to either Dave at adnauseum.com, don't forget the V, or to me at Jeff at adnauseum.com. Uh, let us know what you're thinking, what you like, what you don't like, ideas for episodes. Check out the website. We're going to be reading some comments on the air, aren't we? Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, to celebrate episode 25. Yes. Make your online comments and we'll be reading them live. Yes. So it's not too late to get your comments in. Definitely not. We want to say thank you to our steadfast sound engineer, the recently more annuated Mishka Fernando. Mishka. And to guitar wizards and all-around nice guy Scott Van Zen and Ken Tamplin, who provide the music. So, Jeff, you've got our gustatory parting shot, don't yes. you? Yes, this comes from the inimitable Yogi Berra, who once said, when the waitress asked if I wanted my pizza cut into four or eight slices, I said, four. I don't think I can eat it. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for listening. See ya. See ya.